Hi. 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 You'll notice that Judy and I are using different microphones. And we had a joke backstage that Judy required the phallic one. And I've got this little girl kind of, I won't get too explicit, uh, <laughs> mic right here. It's because um, that, that would, I would have had to take my earrings off. <laughs> and it would ruin my outfit. <laughs> and feminist or no feminist, we never do that. <laughs> Um, it is a great honor to be on stage with a living legend and one of the most important artists of our time. And um, we're going to talk about pussy power. And uh, so what I thought we'd do to start off, I'm very interested, Judy, in what the word pussy means to you and what it's meant over the years. You graduated from UCLA with an MFA in 1964. I assume the word pussy meant something, one thing then. In 1979, you uh, showed the dinner party here at SF MoMA, and this plate, which actually depicts Virginia Woolf, was in uh, that uh, installation. And, um, and now, of course, we have a, a president who's kind of the grabber by the pussy president. And, um, you know, the Women's March in January was populated by people wearing pussy hats, male and female. And uh, so, yeah, what does the word pussy mean to you? And what has it meant? How has it changed for you? Uh, in the 60s, when I came out of graduate school into the L.A. art scene, which was singularly inhospitable to women, I used to hang out with the Ferris Boys, much to their consternation. For those of you who don't know who the Ferris Boys, Ferris Gallery in LA in the 60s was the most important gallery in Southern California. And it was full of guys who had a propensity to do ads like Billy Al Bankson with his motorcycle, Kenny Price on a surfboard, Larry Bell with a cigar, and they used to hang out at a place called Barney's Beanery, and I would hang out with them. And if they wanted to put each other down, they called each other pussy. Don't be a pussy. So I got a clear message that being a pussy was not a good thing. But the problem was, what do you do if you have one? <laughs> <laughs> so imagine my delight that we now live at a time where I was telling Sarah, I do Instagram, it's the only social media I really like because I feel like I can like post things of meaning. And so, you know, people follow me. And like one of, the, one of my followers is something called Club Clitoris. <laughs> and another is Vagina China. <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, um, I was there first. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, the godmother of Vagina China. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be able to do a talk called Pussy Power or have a show called Judy Chicago's Pussies. It's a pleasure. The... And the hell with you, Ferris boys. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can reclaim it now. Yes, we can reclaim it, absolutely. So then the other word in tonight's title is Power, and here are two works, um, Through the Flower from 1973, a magnificent painting, which I think is kind of finding a kind of feminine spiritual power, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, and then very differently, Doublehead with Blue Eye Number 1 from a much later series when you started depicting men and kind of exploring masculinity and, and, and perhaps their, their prerogative with anger. And, 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 and kind of the stigma against uh, the expression of sadness. 
uh, with in this power play series. And this this particular one strikes me as most strange because it looks a little bit like uh, Donald Trump. I think I need a tech person to help me. This is falling off. Um, so anyway, what does power mean to you? Well, uh, power has meant different things to me at different points in my career. In my early work, I was, once I stopped trying to be a boy in order to fit into the LA art scene and decided to be myself as an artist, um, I struggled with social definitions of female power is negative. And uh, tried to overcome that in my studio. Because after all, what is an artist without creative power? One of the problems for women artists, I think even today, is if we look at what happened to Hillary Clinton, we see that still society has a great deal of difficulty dealing with powerful women. And if you're alone in your studio and you're afraid of your own power, then you can't really fully express yourself. So once I like struggled through my own anxieties in my studio, I began to look back in history to see about how, if there had been powerful women in the past, and important women, because in the 60s, it, people used to say women had never, ha, didn't have a history. This is before women's studies, before any um, widespread understanding that our history has been erased. And so then I was interested in trying to restore the power to women that had been erased in history, which is part of why I did the dinner party. And then I was interested in the power of birth, which I did actually in the Bay Area. I did a whole series of images on birth in, the, in Benicia. And I used to say in response to the idea of women being powerless, if everybody had to see the vulva giving birth, the idea of women being powerless would completely disappear. Um, in the 80s, I did this series called Power Play, which is going to be shown in New York again in uh, January. It was an examination of the construct of masculinity before the advent of queer theory or masculinity studies. And as usual, I started in the library. And when I looked up gender, the only books that came up were about women, as if only women had gender. So I was then interested in the way in which power has affected men and the way their power has affected the world. I think power and powerlessness have been major currents in my work. Of course, then my husband, photographer Donald Woodman, and I did an eight-year project on the Holocaust. And you could say that the Nazis exemplified, up until that point in time, the most grotesque use of power. And most recently, I finished um, a project that looks at the powerlessness of other creatures in the face of human power. We're going to go back to the beginning. Sorry, I thought I still had the other mic on. So tell us, what's a nice Jewish girl doing with a name like Chicago? 
<laughs> well, <clears throat> like you were Cohen and I, come I, from I, a long line of rabbis. Yes, I was born. 23 generations. 23 generations up until my father who broke away and eschewed all things Jewish, was a Marxist and a labor organizer. And when Donald and I were doing research on the Holocaust Project, I was telling a uh, rabbi who, because we consulted a lot of scholars and a lot of people in and out of the Jewish community before we started even making any art, I was telling him about you know, my lineage back to the Vilna Gaon and he and my father and he said that's all right moses was the first labor organizer <laughs> but okay so i got to la when i was 17 to go to ucla and I, from chicago and i brought this incredible chicago accent okay I had a proto-feminist consciousness, and so I kept my maiden name even when I married my first husband, Jerry Garowitz. But then I noticed that there were a lot of Cohen's showing. Yes. So I decided to use his name, and which was more unique. So uh, the thing is, is that when I was in my first gallery, Ralph Nelson Gallery. It was a time in LA that a lot of artists had underground names. And my first dealer used to call me Judy Chicago because I had such a strong Chicago accent. And like, um, I don't know if you know who Ed Rache is, but he was Eddie Russia, and Larry Bell was Ben Lux, and we all listed our names in the phone book under our underground names. It was like a thing. So then my first husband died. I was 23 years old. And people would come up to me and say, I knew your parents. But they weren't my parents, they were Jerry's parents. So I felt like I didn't have a name. When at the end of the 60s, I decided to make a radical change in my art making and be myself as a woman and try and figure out how to create a feminist art practice and also how to um, develop a, a form of art education that was more appropriate for young women where they didn't have to do what I had had to do, which was to eschew any indication of gender in my work. I wanted to make um, a public statement about the fact that I was changing directions. Also, we the early days of the women's movement, we didn't really have our own forms and we kind of borrowed from the Black Panthers and stuff, you know, so it was like really radical. Took out an ad in art form, changed my name. But the thing is, is that it became my name, and it became symbolic of what I was setting out to do. But here's the thing. Do you know the stupidest thing that anybody ever wrote about me? I'm sure there's a lot of really there stupid stuff There is a lot written. of stupid yeah. writing. So what's the stupidest? This One of the two stupidest. <laughs> the, the other one is when somebody asked me how, how I got holes in the needlepoint canvas for the needlepoints in the birth project, the implication being that I had a slave labor factory where people were punching holes in the needlepoint canvas. Anyway, no, that was one of the stupidest. The other stupidest thing that they, somebody wrote was that I changed my name to Judy Chicago so my initials would be JC. And this was just their supposition. This was their supposition. They didn't bother to go back and find out what my name was, except for those very, my initials were, except for that very narrow window of time when I mistakenly you used my first. You were always JC. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and just to explain the images, um, here on the left we have an invitation, and on the right the art forum ad in which uh, Judy declares that she's renouncing patriarchy and um, taking on a name of her choosing rather than those of her um, late husband or, and at that point, late father. Yes. 
Um, I, 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 I just love the boxer image. Yeah, and, yeah, we and you are very much a fighter. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, but you know, this is how myth happens, okay? The story of the boxing ring ad. Yeah. I had a dealer named Jack Glenn, whose family in Kansas City made their fortune by developing the system of putting names on like uh, bowling shirts. And you know, I told you about how all the Ferris boys, you know, like did these macho posters for their shows, the studs and this and that. And so they, they, they actually had this did have a group show, those called boys the studs, called the right. studs. So Jack came up with this idea for an announcement, and I thought it was hilarious because it was like a takeoff of the boys, right? Well, what happened was that Art Forum was in LA then. And the editor of Artform tried to get Jack Glenn to run the ad as full page, and Jack didn't want to pay for it. And so it was just a mailer. So Phil Eater published it as a full page ad in Artform for nothing. And it was right when women artists around the country were really getting pissed off at the sexism in the art world. And so it became like this kind of mythic thing, you know? And so, I mean, I would visit women artist studios would be up on their walls, and I would meet male artists. they say, you want a box? Like, I'm like, I mean, it, I was like, so not this. Good on, well, but good on Phil Leader for giving you a free ad. I never knew that. That's awesome. Let's um, uh, now go back a couple of years um, to the, your geometric phase when you're working with color and shape and exploring a kind of minimal aesthetic, but seeming to satirize it with titles like Three Star Cunts, by then, the image by the on the left 69. from 1969, and a study for whirling donuts, yeah, 1968. It, yeah, yeah. In in 1965, I would not have called that drawing three star cunts. I mean, by the time 1969 came around, I was already starting to make this radical change. And also, I knew that there was a lot of hidden content in this work which you know, you've particularly written very movingly about. At the time, it was not, vis people couldn't read this mm -hmm. at all. They could not read it. Mm -hmm. And if they did read it, like you know, I was doing these domes also at that time, if they did read it, it was like the reading Irving Blum from Ferris made of my domes when he called them, oh yeah, the Venus of Willendorf, which was not <laughs> You know, exactly it was not a compliment. Oh, it that's was like, interesting. It was not a compliment. It was like, oh, this icky female stuff like leaked in there. And of course the Venus of Willendorf is actually a kind of a pregnant figure. Right. And so he was associating the domes with the belly. Right. And you know, yeah maternal, not exactly an image of a woman artist, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then let's, I mean, one, I've got up here social protest versus ambiguity because I think that's a tension that a lot of artists experience. And um, sometimes you've, uh, you know, people complain that there's too much ambiguity here and you're not like a hardcore feminist. And then other times for different work, you're too didactic and you're, you know, what's your feeling about that tension, that kind of classic antagonism between the two? Well, um, I very deliberately uh, resisted doing openly political work because from the beginning, from the time I started studying art, as you know, at five, and you know, always wanted to be an artist, always wanted to make a contribution to art history, I wanted to become part of art history. It was one of my singular goal. And I wanted to make art that transcended the time in which I lived, as opposed to making art that was specifically linked to political times. And even, like, I even had a round with the Brooklyn Museum around the dinner party 
when they rehung the heritage panels that explicate the women on the floor in front before you saw the dinner party, and I made them take it down, take them down, because I said, if I wanted to make a didactic piece, I would have made photo murals with text. <laughs> I made a work of art that when you leave it, and if you're curious about the names on the floor, the heritage panels are there for you to investigate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But by putting them beforehand, it totally changes the experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people say things all the time. If you, they don't like something, you know, they come up, it's like, you know, whatever. <laughs> I'm with you, I'm with you. So, uh, Morning Fan, um, which you can see at Jessica Silverman Gallery, is a really awesomely beautiful, it's, monumental it's painting. It's five feet by 10 feet. And um, you went to Auto Body uh, Spray school. Paint School and were the only women, woman in a class of 300 250. men, 250 men, um, learning how to spray paint to make this kind of perfect painting um, which is very sensual and sees, seems to have kind of some pent up sexual desire in it and even has that kind of vanishing central core for which you're famous. And um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about making this work in Fresno. Yeah, I, I was, uh, this is from a series called Fresno Fans. And I did two series while I was there. That was the year I started the first feminist art program. And one of my goals, as I said before, in starting that program was to help young women become professional artists without having to deny their gender as women, which I had had to do in my education. You know, my professors, my male professors made it very clear that they didn't want any gendered imagery in, in front of their face. And, you know, so even though I was making this radical departure, I had built a language already in the first decade of my career. I had done a lot of work on color. I had built sort of the formal building blocks of my career. And so even though I was giving permission to my students to openly express themselves as women and to work with whatever materials that they were comfortable with, I, in a way, had already distanced myself, and I was trying to find my way back and to bring together my formal language with my real content. But you want to know something, you know, again, I've been talking about this because this work was in storage for a really long time. It wasn't until the Getty Pacific Standard Time that pulled, brought attention to all this early work. And at the time, nobody could read the content of this work. But here's an amazing story. In Pacific Standard Time, one of the paintings in the other series from the Flesh Gardens was in the Getty Show, and some of my male peers objected to it. Not minimal enough. Amazing. Too sensual. So, Not conceptual and dry enough. Right. Yeah. So even in 2011 and 12, they're still clinging on to an old uh, aesthetic and alibi. Yeah, and, but they, they, at least, you know, so now they saw it, but it was unacceptable. Amazing. Well, thank God um, uh, younger generations of artists and art critics and curators look at things differently. Yeah, yeah, that's what happened, and, actually. And it was just blew me away that people started reading this work. Yeah. Well, and I think uh, it, it is um, not hard to understand how the dinner party changed people's consciousness. And, you know, you, you look at the careers of people like Louise Bourgeois, she did not really have a major show in New York until 1981, after this. And it was oh, all of that, decades of work that had been ignored. And I think that maternity and motherhood is a huge theme in Bourgeois' work. 
you know? Yes. And uh, it, it was really beyond the pale and not acceptable within the canons of contemporary art or, or even art history until after we looked at a lot of vagina china. <laughs> well, the dinner party, of course, was in New York in 1980 at Brooklyn. And, yeah. Yeah, at the Brooklyn Museum. But um, I, I just want to make a quick segue about the subject of motherhood and maternity. Because yeah. when I was working on the birth project, you know, Frida Kahlo wasn't that well known then. Mm -hmm. And uh, her My Birth painting was not well known. And I actually thought there were no images of birth in Western art and contemporary art. And a, 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 like two years ago, there was a show in Milan curated by Massimiliano Gioni, who's the head curator at the New Museum, called uh, The Great Mother. And it was an unbelievable show. I discovered, because you know, I knew all about, from doing all the historic research that underpins the dinner party, I knew all about the erasure of women's achievements from history. What I didn't know was there was a whole other form of erasure that had to do with subject matter, you just touched on it, that has not been considered important because it's what women do. There is a huge amount of work on the subject of birth. Interesting. Huge. It just blew me completely away. Okay. Um, I'm just going to assume that everybody knows what the dinner party is, okay? If you don't, you could stand up and say, I don't know what the dinner party is, because you please tell me, okay? <laughs> Moving you, right you, along. It is on permanent display at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. Right. And okay. next time you're in New York, you must pay homage. Um, Make a pilgrimage. This is not the usual shot of the dinner party. The usual shot of the dinner party is looking at it as you walk into the room that it is installed. I wanted Sarah to use this particular picture, which has to be the only overhead shot of the dinner party for the following reason. This is from the old San Francisco Museum installation in 1979, where the dinner party premiered where it was a huge, huge success. The bookstore sold, 100,000 people saw it. There were five hour lines. Karen Finley started her career there doing a piece called The Cocktail Party, uh, honoring 39 gay, gay men. And they were honored by gay men on roller skates who presented their honor on paper plates. So like Vidal Sassoon was a, hair dryer on a paper plane. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the bookstore made so much money that they bought a computerized cash register they called Judy. But anyway. Beautiful. Anyway, <laughs> so the piece was installed. It was, you know, the press preview. There was a huge amount of media. And a Life magazine photographer came to photograph the piece. Number one, he wanted me me to get in the middle of it, and I said no. And he said, Life Magazine might not reproduce it, and I'm like, you know what, I'll live without Life Magazine. Anyway, <laughs> but the thing is, is there were, there were rafters above in the rotunda, yeah. like a walk space, and he weighed 300 pounds, the photographer, and the museum made him sign a waiver. <laughs> saying that if he fell down on the floor, on the heritage floor, and broke it, they would be liable for the entire cost of the whole dinner party. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I wanted you to show that piece. That, that is hysterical. Because I thought it was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are in San Francisco, so isn't it fitting? <laughs> it's... It is fantastic. Um, and no, I had no... I did not identify... I, 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 I got a sneak preview of your question. Okay, about well, hold on. Right. Let me just say, because one of the, um, it's marvelous to see Judy's drawings of and studies for the plates. And there is a beautiful color drawing for Judith, um, the place setting you see here. And of course, you are Judith. Yes, I am. And um, I'm just wondering if this is a self portrait. No. <laughs> 
I mean, first of all, I, you know, I told you my father eschewed all things Jewish. You know, I grew up without knowing very, I grew up in a secular Jewish household. You know, it was only when Donald and I embarked on the Holocaust Project that both of us grew up in the same kind of household, so I didn't have a lot of Jewish consciousness. I didn't know anything about Jewish history. But the dinner party tells the, I mean, what I set out to do was to tell the story of the history of Western civilization is we all had learned it through a series of heroes representing different times. So I had to have somebody to represent the she development. She saved Israel. Jude right. Yeah, Jude by, by you know, cutting off the head of Holofernes. Thanks for pronouncing that for me. <laughs> yes. So, you know, she's a great Jewish heroine. So yeah. I thought she would, you know, so it's like, okay, there was Moses in history, and there's Judith in her story. Yeah. Yeah, and she's got a knife coming oh, no, out well, of her big a, J. Well, that, of course, is a, cut, uh, it's a reference to Holofernes. And actually, yeah. the Hebrew that goes down the side says, Judith, heroine of her people. So... Um, in the show, in the Tenderloin, there are three test plates which are all related to this one, and I may mispronounce this. Rosvita. Oh, Rosvita. Yeah. That's easy to pronounce. You just ignore the H. Okay, great. A medieval nun, poet and playwright. Unclear if she was actually a nun. It was a period in time when women, where the convent actually became a place, an alternative to women who may not have wanted to marry mm -hmm. and lose their fortunes, for And example. also to be educated. And to be educated and to be able to practice, in her case, writing. Mm -hmm. Her abbess supported her. Mm -hmm. Not clear if she ever took vows. She did, in fact, live in, in a convent. Okay. So tell me, she does have a bit of a habit. In, yes, actually, in, that's right. See now that, And she looks like she's praying. Yes, that's absolutely right. I mean, I love, I actually am completely captivated by this idea of representing women through these vaginas, actually. Well, but and, actually, because they're so different and they're so expressive and you've used, it's a, this, you know, biomorphic challenge to represent whole, kind of the whole social and historical aspect of a woman through these means. Well, you know, there's going to be this show that opens next month at the Brooklyn Museum called Roots of the Dinner Party, uh, History in the Making, which will be the first actual look after 40 years uh, at my creative process in doing the dinner party. And I hope that there, that there will also be, I think, some new iconographic reading. Okay, so let's do an iconographic yeah. reading. First of all, as I've said to people, but it seems not to have like connected. Uh, there is a point. Uh, there's use, making vaginal references in the dinner party had a point. There are 39 women represented at the dinner party table, across century, across country, religion, profession, geography. The only thing they have basically in common, and the reason they're not known, is they had vaginas. So that there's a point to that, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the imagery, along with the idea of challenging the notion that the phallus is universal and the vagina is something specific. else. Specific. Right. Right. So I also was trying to build a new kind of language, visual language. But as the dinner party, as the work, as the years went by and the dinner party, and I began to develop the images, and after I wanted them to become dimensional as a way of talking about the rise and fall of women's history, that there, are, it's like, you know, everybody says like now is, oh, women artists are so much, you know, that's a great period for women artists. There have been other periods that have been great for women artists, and then they've been completely erased again. So the change in dimension in the place chronicles that rise and fall mm -hmm. through history. Um, 
And then I got interested, particularly after I started designing the needlework runners, which tell something about the lives and create the context for the play. I, 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 got, I started incorporating iconography, needle techniques from the period. So the Rosvita plate sits on a runner that's done in a technique called Opus Teutonicum, which was the type of needlework that was done in Germany at the time she lived. And the imagery on the plate, you're absolutely right, that's a nun's cap. And the monastery Fairly virginal. Yeah, well, they, I mean, yeah, well, well, right. I love that about yeah. her, actually. And it's quite a pristine plate, I'd say. And also the hand, that praying hands. Yeah. Actually, this is sort of funny. You know, nobody ever got any jokes in the dinner party. There are a lot of jokes, visual there, jokes. So this many. Is, this is right. I, this it is really one. Okay. It's so witty. At this time in the monasteries, you know, people didn't have bathrooms. You know, they had outhouses, you know. I mean, and in the monastery, on the sides of the monasteries, there were, like, stalls for people, from the, for the populace. And the nuns used to walk through the center courtyard. This is, again, how mythology happens. And they would have their hands, and they'd have their head down so as not to intrude and see people peeing. <laughs> and that became associated with piety. Amazing. So that's the gesture she's making. The, and it's great. The SF MoMA um, gave me this photo of you on the left. And these are not the same plate. There's th three test plates in the show. And this is the, this one does not have the hands. Right. And they change. A slightly because, different palette. But it was so difficult. Once we started, once I wanted the plates to rise up, I started painting on Japanese porcelain, which is incredibly strong. And I could china paint it and fire it for, you know, 12 or 14 times. But to be able to do that with the dimensional plates became a huge challenge. Yes. And so we started in, I mean, we were break, they were breaking at every stage, bisque glaze, china paint. So we would do six or eight or 10 plates to try and get one out of the kill. Yeah. Well, I'm going to skip these next two slides just to show them, but we'll move on in okay. the interest of time. Um, oh. uh, and it is a very interesting story, but for another time, you've talked about it many times before, um, the, the huge number of people involved um, working on your designs. Um, and then here's the map uh, starting in San Francisco and settling in Brooklyn via 16 different cities around the world. Um, and then here we're, 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 we're going to start talking about cats. Um, and the first time you pun on the word pussy um, is when you do potent pussy homage to Lamont, and Lamont was my cat who died. Lamont Cranston, he was named after. Uh, uh, when I was growing up, I used to listen to radio shows with my father, and the one I liked the best was the uh, lead character was named Lamont Cranston. It was called The Shadow. What evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. I remember from when I was a little girl. And Lamont was a black cat? Yes, he was a black cat. And I, are these cats eyes or are they central core they're images? They're both, actually. They're and actually a, both because they're yeah. like three. And, and, and the reason, actually, it was really interesting when Jessica and I were you know, working on what to show, and she wanted to show this series called Kitty City. And I'm like, you know, people aren't going to have any context for it in the Bay Area. I haven't had a show since the dinner party. You know, where, how did she get from the dinner party to Kitty City? And so we started looking at my flat files, and we realized that this overlap between pussies and pussies goes back a long time. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Um, so these tell, are graphite drawings. Yeah, they're really beautiful, and they are installed down in the Tenderloin. Um, tell what are your theories about the association between femininity and femininity? Well, Why the pussy pussy thing? I mean, when I when I when I started Kitty City, you know, I was investigating like 
of course, the history of cats. I wanted to do this series based on a, a medieval book of hours, kind of a day in the lifetime of our house. And it was probably one of, I, I, it was an exploration into human animal relationship, which I've continued looking at since then. And um, so in my research, of course, there's all, Historically, there's an association between women and cats dating back to the, to the Inquisition, where actually it's horrible. The Inquisition targeted cats. They instructed people to burn them alive, skin them, flay them, be, at particularly black cats, because they were considered familiars of witches. And also, there's been association between vanity in women and, you know, pussies. And these little watercolors are actually, I did specifically for the introduction to Kitty City, for the page introduction, because it is, it's an illuminated manuscript. And um, this is like a historic image, a beckoning cat, or a cat grazing, gazing into the mirror. I mean, they draw on historic images. Mm -hmm. uh, they're magnificent. I really, uh, I'm a cat lady, and I'm actually going to demonstrate my cat ladiness because, test me on this, um, these are Judy's cats. Um, from this period uh, in the early 2000s, and I believe we have Pete and repeat on the Ottoman. They're, uh, they're wait, no, wait, kittens. don't, don't, oh. shh, okay. I, because I, I'm pretty sure I know this. Inca is uh -huh. the black one, Trio's the ginger, Milagro, named by Donald, is up in a, a painting of well, himself. But no, is she, or is she, she lived in Donald's office. Ah, up a, so up a step. And so she was very isolated. The rest of the cats were all very companionable. And that's Romeo. That's Romeo. And that is Veronica. The Ver I knew that. I was going to say Veronica. that. And she's, she's kind of already deceased in They're this all, picture. The only cat that's... No, she died while she I died, was doing but is Kitty that why City. She's kind of drawn in a different yeah, yeah. way. Yeah, she, she's yeah. the ghost of Veronica yeah, is up on the, the top yes. of the chair. Yes, that's right. The I was so proud that I figured out Good who all the reading, cats were. Sarah. But um, so tell us what's going on here because it is a book of hours and it is documentation. It's interesting, you did um, the birth project and you've represented women in different ways. This is really a representation of family. Well, it's also about the something everybody knows if they're close to their companion animals, is that human beings are not the only creatures that individuate. Yeah. You know, like our, our cat sitters always used to complain because they couldn't keep track the different cat treats in, <laughs> that they had to give if we traveled. They'd have to give feed the cats and give them treats because they all like different treats. You know, just like people, they had their own tastes. Yeah. And so, I mean, Kitty City is like an exploration of our relationship with the cats, their relationships with each other, what they do all day. I had, you know, because like, uh, David Hockney has done a lot of drawings in, of his dogs, but they're usually sleeping because, you know, I mean, animals really don't pose, especially not cats, unless they're asleep. So, like, I had to get up in the middle of the night. I had no idea what they did at 2 in the morning. <laughs> and since I was chronically in a day in the life of our household, yeah. you know, I found out what they, they play at 2 in the morning. I mean, they carried on at two in the morning. We're sleeping, you know, then at six in the morning, they'd all come in and say, wake up, wake up. So, I mean, Kitty City chronicles a day in our, the life of our household, and it's about, um, I guess it is about family. Of course it's about family. Uh, they're very loving. They really are. And, um, and of course, there's moments of anthropomorphism with regard to the mirrors, less so here perhaps, except they do have these kind of intense what? stares. You know, 
they're making kind of that kind of soulful eye contact. Oh, yeah, right. Well, because they're looking at you, you know, it's a way of individuating them. You know, instead of drawing them like this with their head in there, you know, I mean, I, I tried to paint them as individuals. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the other thing I think is that I, w I think I was trying to suggest that we have a very limited and often horribly exploitative relationship with most cre of the creatures on the planet. We look at them as being there for us. And I think I was trying to introduce the individuality of our cats as a way of introducing discourse about other species and the right of other species to live their species lives mm -hmm. independent of us. Something, a theme that, as I said, I've come back to in my most recent project. And we will open to questions, but just one last um, query. Uh, because there, you have a whole history of working um, with having a different attitude towards nature and being very critical of um, the male earthworks, let's say, that would bulldoze and damage uh, environments. And when you did your smoke pieces, let's say, and um, Judy did a, one of her uh, smoke pieces at SF MoMA back in April, I believe. But you've also done them out um, in broader natural environments. Yeah. Um, I mean, it would seem that that is all kind of part of the same impetus of, uh, you know, not wanting to be destructive, being respectful of nature of all kinds. Well, see, I mean, that's, for me, feminist, feminism, being a feminist, is about having a different point of view. And being a feminist artist is not just about making images of women. It's about bringing a different philosophy to bear on how we live our lives, how we interact with each other, how we treat the planet, how we treat other creatures, bringing respect and making space for every voice. It's an upending of the values of the world in which we live. On that note, okay, let's now we need open. to get the lights out of our eyes so we can see you. Open it up. We'd love, Judy would love comments, questions. What about you? Wouldn't you like some? I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> we have microphones. I see, a, I see someone right back there. Uh, um, yep. Great. Please, introduce, please introduce yourself before you ask a question or make a comment. Hello, um, my name is Miriam Menzel. I'm, uh, I want to ask you something that's different from everything you've talked about tonight, which is um, your merger poem, uh -huh. um, which I was wondering, um, I heard about it through liturgy in synagogue, and I'm wondering whether that was your intention or something you had in mind when you wrote it, um, or was it a surprise? to you that it has Got incorporated become... into liturgy? Yes. Yeah, it was a huge surprise. In fact, actually, somebody told me that they didn't have any idea I was an artist. They thought I was a poet because they had encountered the merger poem in liturgy. It's not just Jewish liturgy either. It's across uh, religions, which is interesting. I wrote the merger poem when I was working on the dinner party. And actually, it is... It reflects um, the underpinnings of the dinner party. And some of the phrases are on the banners that introduce the dinner party. It's, uh, 
for those of you who don't know it, it's a visionary poem about, how, about transforming the world. And of course, um, when Donald and I did all of our research for the Holocaust Project and on our history as Jews, I realized that long before I developed Jewish consciousness, you know, like I already was infused with the values of tikkun olam from the family I grew up in. And I would say that poem reflects those values. The next question is on your right. Judy. Where are you? I'm over here. Oh, Judy. oh over there. Hi. Who are you? Juan Espinoza from UCLA. Oh, really? Hi. <laughs> Hi, Judy. <laughs> we went to school together. <laughs> Judy, I was curious in reading, when you talked about your cats, and when I read Rilke and Yeats and so many other poets, they talk about different powers, and I wondered, do you get some powers from your cats? Do they, do they talk to you to help you or to to somehow give you a certain way of looking at your work, the cats, the power of the energy of the cats? <laughs> One of the images in Kitty City is take your cats to work <laughs> when they sit on my drawings. Is that what you mean? No, 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 <laughs> no I know, I'm teasing. Not at all, not at all. I'm, I'm teasing you, Juan. Okay. What have you been doing all these years? <laughs> well, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that. Well, I'll, I'll go backstage. But the other thing I was so very... <laughs> Very curious about when you did the, the um, how do you say, the dining room? What was that? This, this, the, the, how do you say it? What was the year you did the dinner party? Between 1974 and 79. Okay. We've come a long way since then. I wonder if you were to do the dinner party now, Judy, how would you differ it in terms of all women? Because now with all the gender divisions we have and how much we've changed since then, how, how would that really? change? Really? Tell Should that be, what did you say? tell that to a woman in Pakistan or Afghanistan who's not allowed out of the house. Tell it to a woman in Africa who is disallowed any sexual pleasure. No, we are yes, in the United States we have come a long way. But I don't I mean I I see the story the dinner party tells is a much bigger story than us at this moment in time. The next question is on your left. Hi, Judy, I'm Bianca Taylor. I saw your, uh, I saw the dinner party in the Brooklyn Museum when I was there last summer and it was really incredible. Um, Thank you. My question is, what is something about the art world today that makes you hopeful? What is it about the art world now that makes me hopeful? What is something? Can you think, of, is there anything about the art world that makes you hopeful? <laughs> the fact that, you know, artists keep working in the face of all the challenges there are and that ultimately the creative impulse can't be stopped, but I have a lot of criticisms of the art world now. But she loves her dealers. Um, the next question is right here on the right. Hi. I'm over here. Over here. Over this It's side. really hard because the light's in my yeah. eyes. Yeah, okay. I'm Julie Mills. Okay, and hi. I'm wondering if when you were at UCLA uh, as a student, if you faced pushback and discrimination from professors for trying to do feminist art there? Well, there was no word feminist art then. You know, that word only was created in the 70s. So there was no, there was no word for female-centered work. And in fact, in 1965, when I was showing at Rolf Nelson in LA, he had a 24-foot cloud painting by Georgia O'Keeffe hanging in his gallery. It was for sale for $35,000 and there was no interest whatsoever. And did I face, I mean, I grew up in a family that believed in equal rights for women. I was very, very fortunate. The bad news is they forgot to tell me the rest of the world didn't <laughs> go along with that. So I get to UCLA and I'm this like ambitious young 
woman and I, I minored in philosophy and I'm sitting in a philosophy class and I raise my hand to ask a question and the professor does not call on me. He calls on every guy who's got his hand up. And I'm like waving my hand until I got so embarrassed that he had to call on me. Yes. I faced, and I got sexually harassed out of uh, becoming a pyrotechnician by the guy who owned the fireworks company and uh, the most important curator in Southern California saw a piece of mine in my studio in Pasadena that went on to become a legendary piece and he refused to look at it. Why did he refuse to look at it? Well, Judy, he said, you have to understand Women in the 60s were either groupies or wives of artists. And what was I supposed to make of the fact that you were making art that was stronger than the men's? I had to avert my eyes. And he actually thought I would say, oh, Walter, I understand. That was Walter Hopps? Yes. <laughs> that was Walter Hopps. The next question is down in, <laughs> <laughs> in front. I want to thank you so much. Who are you? I'm Beatrice Bowles. I'm a writer and a storyteller. I live here. I saw the dinner party all those years ago and never got over it, so it's a thrill to have you here. But most of all, for lifting off the curse of Eve that we're punished for sin, curiosity, and wisdom, and making pleasure and ecstasy so, so central. This amazing capacity, despite Trump, despite everything, it's rising. And that is a great tribute to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jordan, there's someone back here on the left. Yep, Maggie has the next question. and then I'll Right here on your Sorry. right. Oh, OK. <laughs> I'm loud without the mic. I'm Patty. Um, I'm an alum from the California Institute of Integral Studies. Uh, which had the first woman's spirituality PhD. Uh, I love your work. I've used it in ritual, especially the part on all the witches, <laughs> uh, to create ritual, to remember them. They're kind of my people. I'm always really impressed by the books you put out that go with all of your different art installations. So I'm looking forward to the next book. And I wonder what um, <clears throat> inspires you to do the books along with the projects. I wrote my first book because of Anna East Nin, the writer, the diarist. She, I that. Yeah, she, she, it was a time I was really struggling with the idea of could there be a female aesthetic and if so, what that might look like. And she, she, she helped me a lot. And she's, I, you know, I had all these thoughts tumbling around in my mind. And she said, you can't live through everything, but you can write through everything. Then I wrote, about my work because nobody else would write about my work. Now I'm not writing about my work anymore because there are all these other people who are writing about my work. I can only do two more questions. I'm really tired. So we have time for one more. Good. OK. This will be the last question. OK. Hi, Judy. I'm Tanya Augsburg. So I'd like to just tell the audience that you were an inspiration for another exhibition, San Francisco, that came out last year, the Fuck You in the Most Loving Way show. And I just want to thank you because, because of your input, we were able to expand the show and we had this piece called Revisiting Woman House, which was, um, I don't know if everyone knows that Judy was a co-director of this historic exhibition called Woman House, feminist art exhibition, which we didn't talk about today, but probably didn't have enough time. And um, so my question is really, um, what are your thoughts about education today for young women and um, do you think it's getting better for them in terms of education or are you inspired by it or do you have some choice words I'm sure you do for uh, the situation I, I, today I have no idea I mean I'd have to ask young women is it getting I, how many young women are here raise your hand quite a few I think yeah. yeah so is are you happy with your education is it meeting your needs if there are young women artists or women students, art students, are you getting what you need from the art schools? What? Yes. I was actually a feminist modern art history maker. 
Oh, could you bring her? Yeah, yeah. So she was a feminist modern art history major. And so it's great you can be a feminist art history major. Yes, actually. Um, Actually, I interned at National Museum for Women in the Arts. So next time I'm home, I'll, you know, go visit it. Um, I think one of the benefits of being a young woman today and having identity even expanding to include so many people is when you want to learn about yourself, which is so much of what art history is, so many schools, not as, not as many as I would like, but so many schools are encouraging students to expand what they want to learn as a reflection of who they are as people. So you see these art departments encouraging feminist art history curriculums and uh, queer identity and even masculine identity and, and you know, they're, they're very nurturing. I'm not gonna lie, I've definitely experienced some, some pushback, but I, I was very fortunate. I, I'm not sure if I'm really young, I just turned 33, but <laughs> literally this week. Um, I, I, I can only hope it gets better. As, as long as people, not just women, are angry and want to learn, my hope is schools will follow suit. Well, thank you everyone for coming out today and I think the word inspiration came up many, many times and I have to say that you are an inspiration to me as well and it's been a a, a great pleasure to be on stage with you. For me too, Sarah.